Welcome to the 5 p.m. evening service here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church, or at least the virtual version of it. We begin tonight in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we gather together in worship, we always like to begin by recognizing who we are before God and what he has made us through the cross. We do so through our confession and absolution. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Join me, if you will. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading this evening comes from the the New Testament book of Romans, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse six. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. This is the word of the Lord. After reading the scripture, we share together a common confession of faith. This evening we'll be using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The message this evening is going to come from our reading in the book of Romans in the fifth chapter. I want to spend just a little time in this, in this text kind of a, a, probably an under-read text. It, it deals with some 
rather deep th theological ideas. But if you'd like to get out a Bible, you can follow along in your own Bible. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, but feel free to use whatever version you'd like. But I'd like to begin by focusing on the 11th verse this evening. The 11th verse of Romans 5. And one word to be specific, the word rejoice. Rejoice. Verse 11 of Romans 5 tells us this. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We also rejoice. This word in the ancient Greek, the original text, kochemai, is often translated in the rest of the New Testament as to boast or to have confidence. But here, in the book of Romans, specifically the fifth chapter, all three times it occurs, in the English Standard Version, the King James Version, and others, the word is translated rejoice. Now that seems to be quite different than the idea of boast. So I thought it would be important just to focus for a minute on, on the word itself because rejoicing is a pretty darn important concept. It, it's something we'd like to have a lot more of, at least I would. So the origin or etymology of this word uh, comes from the root word uh, oxen. Uh, not oxen like the animal, but oxen is in the kind of a A-U-X-E-N form, oxen. And it means neck, strangely enough. And in this form, the idea being conveyed is of holding one's head up high, of having a, a, a strong, straight neck, holding your head up high, feeling confident. Some translations use the term exultant, like, yes, head high. Jewish scholars who translated the Old Testament into Greek, which we call the Septuagint, it was written about 200 to 300 years BC, they used this word to translate the Hebrew, or the Old Testament original language, um, in, in terms of joyous exaltation such as we find in, in Psalm 511. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. The same word here is used. Another way of expressing this idea is the idea of boastful exuberance. Now I bet all of us can remember a time when we felt this way. That kind of jump in the air, just score the winning goal feeling. That, that sense of happiness and pride and enthusiasm all mixed together. Those times when we just go, yes, and we're just, just, yes. Just all those wonderful emotions all melded to where our heads are high, we're rejoicing. This is not just the, the temporary sensual pleasures we get from a good meal or some extravagant purchase. This isn't pleasure. This is a continuing sense of joy. A continuing sense of joy that often defies the circumstances around us. The, the mountain climber that reaches the peak is exhausted, is hungry, is cold, is feeling half dead. But when they get to the top of that mountain, yes, exuberance, rejoicing. This is an important idea. I'll bet you, like me, would like a little bit more of this, a lot more feeling like this. Now on the surface, it seems odd that the writer of Romans 5 would use such a phrase considering all the suffering and persecution the followers of Christ experienced during this time. I mean, the Roman Empire just had its, uh, to use a, a current idiom, had its foot on the neck of the Christian church. Christians were treated terribly by Romans and others of the day. And while it's hard to compare our sufferings to that of the early church, we do have our problems, especially in these past few months. We've had pandemic, riots, political, social, and racial turmoil, just 
Society seems to be angry everywhere you look. There's unemployment. We're in a world that seems to be increasingly hostile, not only to the Christian faith, but just to each other. And this isn't even considering the challenges of everyday life. Just getting by. For many of us, moments of exultant joy, especially recently, they're few and far between. We'd really like some more. In this past month, I'll admit for myself, trying to do my own work while trying to help three teenagers get through their final weeks of quarantine school, which has been extremely challenging, while at the same time, my wife is finishing her final semester of quarantine law school, things would at times just get really stressful. My patience would get really thin. And if I stubbed my toe or some little thing happened, it often just send me over the edge and I would just walk away grumbling and muttering and just ugh. The opposite of exultant joy. In fact, it was amusing. The, the other night, Pastor Darkis at the council meeting was sharing how he had been saving up money, he and Mary, to, to purchase a shed or have a shed built for all of his books when he retires. Because if you know Pastor Gargitz, he's got an amazing library. And he's working on the idea of, of having a place to store a lot of those books so they don't fill up the house. And while he said that, I was thinking to myself, hey, I'm on a shed. Not for any books, but for me, I just would like a place to, to run and hide sometimes. Things are stressful. I can't remember the last time I had one of these jump in the air, head held high, feelings of joy. How about you? So, so why the problem? Why aren't we rejoicing more? Is it merely the result of difficult times? How can we have more of this rejoicing in our life? Is it possible that this word, this feeling described to us in Romans 5, this exalted joy, this rejoicing, this jump in the air, excited feeling, is it possible we can have this on a more regular basis? Could this be something that's much more common in our lives than it is now? Well, let's go back to the text, go back to verse 11. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In, in that simple text, in that simple verse, the answer is laid out very clearly in a few very simple words. Here it is. How do we rejoice? In and through Jesus Christ. That's it. How do we become people that are known for having a, a common attitude of jump in the air, head held high, exultant joy? In and through Christ. What, it, what does that mean? Why, why is it important? Because what it's saying is that Jesus Christ is both the source and the means of a life of rejoicing. Rejoicing is in him and through him. Where do we find every ingredient for joy? In Christ. How do we acquire and turn those ingredients into joy? Through Christ. Everything required for joy, for rejoicing, is Christ. All there. So what's the problem? It sounds so easy. I mean, it sounds like we have nothing to do. But let's stick further into our text. And I think what we'll find is two very important human tendencies that are really getting in the way of our lives being known for exalted joy, for getting in the way of us having this feeling or this just this state of being in a more common way. And the first barrier that our text seems to point out, the first barrier to rejoicing, seems to be that human beings, all of us, continually overestimate our own abilities to bring ourselves joy. We overestimate our abilities to bring ourselves joy. You know, the 
ancient Greek philosophers, many of them, such as Aristotle, referred to the idea of this state of continuing joy as something called a eudaimonia. And it was, it was kind of uh, the idea of a happy life, a good life. And they considered this to be the highest good, as it was the only thing in the human life that was an end in and of itself, and not a means to an end. I mean, you may like a, a good meal, but you like a good meal because it fulfills another need. It makes you happy. Uh, you, may, you may love to sail, as I do, but you love to sail because it fulfills another need. It makes you happy. And, and philosophers like Aristotle rightly noticed that the only thing in the human life that's an end in and of itself is happiness. I mean, if you think about it, even our faith, even, even the reason that we're concerned about our Christianity, honestly, is we think this is what will ultimately bring the most happiness and joy. I don't want to go to hell. I, I want to go to heaven. I want to live a life that is, that is richly blessed by Christ. I want to spend eternity in the perfect arms of God. Why? I think that's what's going to make me filled with joy, with happiness. Hell sounds miserable. I don't even like it when it's hot in the house. But these Greek philosophers also believed that human beings could achieve this state by their own efforts and abilities. And for 2,000 years, <coughs> philosophers have been debating, debating how we can do this. And it's long been determined by the secular world that human wisdom is the key. Human wisdom, if applied correctly, will bring us this eudaimonia, this state of joy. How's that been working? 2,000 years later, the human mind has failed to make this happen. So what does God say about it? What does God say about human beings in light of this goal of rejoicing, happiness? Well, if we look through each verse of Romans 5, 6 through 11, I want you to notice the terms used to describe the condition of all human beings, of all the human beings that people like Aristotle were, were believing with confidence had the ability to find this joy, this rejoicing in and of themselves. What does our text say who we are as humans? Well, if we look at verse 6 of our text, it says we are weak and ungodly. If we look at verse 8 of our text, it says we're sinners. If we look at verse 9, it says we're under the wrath of God. If we look at verse 10, it says we are enemies of God. If we look at verse 12, it says we're dead. Now, according to God, how capable are human beings of achieving a state of joy? If we are weak, ungodly, sinners under the wrath of God, enemies of God, and dead. If it's up to us, there's no hope. I mean, these texts don't even mention things like pandemics and riots. It's also interesting, maybe a little frightening, that verses 12 through 14 make it clear that our problem is not just a falling short of the ideal not just a failure to live up to our potential. We are told that failure is in our very blood. Since the fall of Adam, our very nature is death. From the point of Adam's fall, every human being was corrupted. In verse 13, we're told that sin was in the world even before the law was given. Think about that for a moment. God is telling us that we were still sinners even when there were no rules to break. Think about the time of Noah and the flood when all the world was declared unrighteous to the point of being destroyed. What rules were they breaking? God had not even given the law yet. In other words, we're not bad just because we break rules. We are just bad, period. 
It's our nature. We are dead. We are, by the very DNA of our physical bodies, the very core of our soul, just broken. So all these people that are expecting to find the ingredients for joy inside here, in this mind, in this heart, in this soul, according to God, it's hopeless. Where are you going to find that in the weakness and the sin and the wrath and the death? There's no, there's nothing in there that would or should lead to rejoicing. And if you or anyone else continues to look for either the ability or the source or the ingredients for joy, for rejoicing, if you're gonna keep looking inside yourself for that, you're just gonna keep being disappointed. True joy can only be found when we stop expecting to find it in ourselves or through our own efforts or even the efforts of others. C.S. Lewis uh, in the book Mere Christianity puts it this way. Your real new self, which is Christ's and also yours and yours because it is his, will not come as long as you are looking for it. It will come when you are looking for him. Does that sound strange? Well, the same principle holds, you know, for more everyday matters, even in social life. You will never make a good impression on other people until you stop thinking about what sort of impression you are making. Even in literature and art, no man who bothers about originality will ever be original. Whereas if you simply try to tell the truth, without carrying a two-pence, how often it has been told before, you will nine times out of ten become original without ever even noticing it. The principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. <clears throat> Excuse me, keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But if you look for Christ, you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. C.S. Lewis has a way of putting things brilliantly. This brings me to the second barrier to having more rejoicing in our life. While we overestimate our human ability to find or produce joy, we underestimate the work of grace. We underestimate the work of grace. We first looked at phrases used to describe the human condition, but now look at what the text says about Christ's work, his work of grace upon the cross. Verse 6 of our text, Christ died for the weak and ungodly. Verse 8, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Verse 10, Christ died for us while we were enemies of God. And most importantly, why did he do this? Why did he give his life? Verse 8, because he loved us. Because he loved us. Now, we toss this phrase around a lot as Christians. We, we talk about love, 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 and even the secular world, love, love, love. We, we love to throw around the word love. But I don't think we generally perceive this idea the way the Bible is communicating. This is not reasonable love we're talking about here. The love of Christ as described by this and every text of the New Testament would likely far better be described as being in love rather than just love. 
There is a big difference between being in love and love. We use the word love in a lot of ways. We say we love our family. We, or at least I, also say we love pizza, maybe a, a good movie, maybe it's a hobby or some activity. And all of these types of love have some sort of reason or rational basis. We can explain why we love that person or that thing. We can, we can give a reason, we can give an explanation. Oh, well, this is why I love this or them. It, it sounds very rational. But when you are in love, that's not easy to explain. In fact, try explaining what being in love is like to a five-year-old. Until they experience love, no idea. It's very difficult to explain being in love. Being in love just seems to happen in us and to us. At times it can become even overwhelming. It seems so out of our control. It's like some alien force has overtaken yours or someone else's heart and mind. When we talk about the human experience of being in love, we're not talking about a whole lot of rational, logical thinking, especially when we're young. Remember being a teenager and being in love? My goodness, I made some really bad decisions because of being in love. Ever try to make yourself fall in love with someone? Did your parents or friends ever tell you why you shouldn't be in love with this person or that person and give you a list of rational reasons why being in love with this or that person was foolish? Ever try to make yourself fall in love with someone? More importantly, have you ever tried to make someone else fall in love with you? How well does that work? You think back to especially younger years. Think of those people that you wanted so badly to be in love with you. And they just weren't. There was nothing you could do. You had no ability to change that. When it happens that someone falls in love with you, all you can do is be present, receive it, and return it. The phrase in love conveys a very different picture than just the word love. It's an author named David Redding. He puts it this way in, in, uh, in kind of a very common vernacular. And he says, God is crazy about you. The expense to which he has gone isn't reasonable. The cross was not a very dignified ransom to say the least. It was a splurge of love and glory lavishly spent on you and me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus Christ is in love with you. The Christ who is willing to die for you, a person who can neither do anything or were willing to do anything to deserve it. He's in love with you, passionately, perfectly in love with you. He even goes so far to refer to us, his people, in several places of the New Testament as his bride. And I think that phrasing is very intentional. He's saying we are not just talking about some sort of intellectual love or enjoyment. We are talking about in love that our Lord Jesus Christ is passionately in love with you. That's why it has nothing to do with your ability, your efforts, or even your condition. So are you tired of living with your head hung low? You like me? Want a, a lot more of that feeling of having your head held high, that jump in the air joy that seems to have been missing for quite a while, well, stop looking for it in yourself. Stop trying and failing to do for yourself what Christ is so passionately doing for you, in fact, what he already did. Stop underestimating 
the work of Christ and of grace. Stop putting these artificial limits on what he can and will do to bring you joy. He is the only source and the only means of that incredible idea, that incredible experience of jump in the air, joy, that feeling of yes, it's good. Whatever you've collected in your heart and mind and soul, all the answers that you think will bring you joy, let them go. Let them die. And then refill with his presence. His presence in his word, his presence in your baptism, his presence in the Lord's Supper. And as you continue to receive, you will continue to grow in joy. Not because of what you do, not even because of what you could do, but because of what Christ has done. In Revelation 19, verse 6, we're told, Hallelujah, the Lord God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. The bad news, we have nothing that is truly going to bring us rejoicing. We have none of the ingredients. We have no ability. The good news, everything required for us to have that jump in the air, joy has already been done on the cross and it's freely given to all who want it. The problem, it sounds too good to be true. But I promise you, it's really that simple. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.